I usually always give people this story because it is my very first memory of pro wrestling. It's when I was a five, six year old kid. So this is years ago, years ago, but I still remember to this day, my mother bought me a comic or uh, a coloring book. So I'm a little kid that never, like we grew up on a farm, we didn't have much money. Like my mom would go to town, get groceries, come home. On this day, my mother brought me home a coloring book. This coloring book was the rock and wrestling coloring book, which featured Hulk Hogan and Hillbilly Jim and these characters. And I had no idea what these larger than life characters were, like this big man with a big mustache and long blonde hair. And from that point on, I, like, I would seek it out. I would seek out what wrestling was, because I didn't even have cable. So I didn't know what wrestling was really. And then I would seek it out after that. And then it's my mother's fault that I'm as far into this business as I am. I think uh, it was when I was 18. I think 18 was the, you know, when I, I just, just decided to get up and do it. And because I'm very impulsive by nature. And I feel as though um, at 18 years old, uh, kids shouldn't, should be thinking about other things like college and university. And all I could think about is wrestling. So at 18, when I graduated from high school, all I could think about is like, I want to like body slam people. This is what I want to do full time. And, the, and then I sought it out. And like the internet, like that's how much older I am than a lot of these kids, is the internet was a new thing. It was a brand new thing. So uh, I got on, I found out where there was a uh, school that I could afford, where I could get to, and like I could make ends meet. And I, I got to Ontario. I'm a New Brunswick kid, small New Brunswick kid. And I just backed up and left. And that was it. I just left. I had nothing, just a duffel bag, like a hockey bag full of clothes, and left a little small community in New Brunswick and moved all the way to Ontario to pursue this. When I went to wrestling school, um, they never, I wasn't allowed to have a job. I had to clean and do their bidding. But they wouldn't give you, like, that's a young boy job, but a young boy gets paid in Japan to do this. So I didn't have this. So what they used to do is uh, I used to have to eat. Um, oh, I used to, I, it, this is the embarrassing part, is I, I would steal a little bit of food, like a banana here or there from the grocery store, because I had no money. Uh, or I would eat out of the garbage can at the school. So some of those guys were like just pigs, right? So they would just throw away half a thing, I would eat it. Or if there was cornflakes that nobody had and they're like two years old and stale. I remember these cornflakes being so stale and then eating cornflakes with water. Or the best one. And this is when Scott DeMore met me and uh, knew that I was never gonna leave this business ever, is we were on tour and I never got paid, right? So we're on tour, I would set up the ring, I would tear down the ring, and I would drive one of the, the sound equipment. This van was sound equipment. So we would drive this van full, full of sound equipment, and we were going up to Timmins and Cochrane and all these places, right, so far. And I remember getting to, uh, I do believe it was Timmins, and then we set up the, the ring and stuff like that. And then we decided, like, I want to, I'm like, everybody's hungry. So they went to the thing. And I remember just grabbing change whenever I could. So, like, um, like if there was a pay phone around, just looking around and if there was change. And Scott DeMore uh, remembers me going to uh, the place with them and looking at, there was a hot dog. And the hot dog was 68 cents. And he watched me count change that I had picked up on the road for the last couple days. And I kept, because I had nothing to eat, I wasn't eating. There was no, I didn't eat. I'm a, I was a big, thick farm kid. And then I wasted away down to nothing, no weight. My last time I weighed myself when I was at that wrestling school, I weighed 139 pounds. And when I started there, I was almost 200. So I was a farm kid. So I was counting change and I couldn't make the 68 cents for the hot dog. And then instead, because of, my, because of how I am, he watched me fold it up, put it out again, and recount it. There's no way. I got to have at least 68 cents here. And I did that like three or four times before he said, listen, 
we got to feed this kid or he's going to die. He's going to die out here on us. And then he convinced uh, the guy that owned the school slash company, the shows, that he had to get pizzas. He had to get pizzas for all the guys because he wouldn't pay me. Because he went, why don't you give the kid 10 bucks so he can get something? No, he's paying dues. That was his thing. So Scott went out and he said, he said, hey, we're all hungry. We're tired of like eating out this canteen. I want, get us, we want pizzas. We want pizzas, we want chicken wings. Oh, how many do you want? And he ordered all these boxes of pizzas and Scott, I remember, came up to me and he grabbed, he says, don't show this to anybody. Go back to your room right now and eat it. And don't say a word, just go. And I just remember grabbing this box and like almost having a tear coming down my eye, starving to death starving and just remember this box of uh, uh, it was Domino's, Domino's pizza, this Hawaiian pizza. I didn't even care what it was. It didn't even, even had cheese on it. It was just the crust itself. If it was just the whatever. It could have been just pineapple and I would have eaten it. But it was because he grabbed it and he gave it to me. He says, get out of here with that. Don't tell a soul because that guy wouldn't let me eat. That was this whole thing. Just let me just, would let me waste away to nothing, right? Isn't that crazy? That was my first ever wrestling tour, was with Edge, Christian, Scott Demore, Chi Chi Cruz. Um, who else was on there? Oh, there was a lot. Brackus. Brackus from WWE that lasted a hiccup. He was a bodybuilder guy. Brackus, Gothic Knight. There's a whole bunch of old names that you wouldn't even remember, but those guys, I remember those guys, and I remember them shoving that in my, that box in my hand and get out of here. Just, and I made that last, I made that, I wrapped it up, and I made that last three days. No, nope. no, nope. life, man, crazy. As mainstream as it is, it's still not mainstream. It, it started from a carnival act. So it still has those people that would try to grift people and take their money and just uh, abuse them and then set them away, like throw them away. That's the way, that's the way this business were, uh, used to run. Not so much to, to by today's standards, but it's still there. You Kids get caught all the time up in the racket of trying to go to wrestling school and get these false promises and then leaving with nothing just no money, no money and uh, like a bad experience. And uh, there's been a lot of people, even in my day and age, I've been at this now, uh, as of August, it's been 21 years in this business, 21 years. And the amount of people, I can, I can tell you right now, and it's not, it's not a rough estimate, it's like, it's a pretty good estimate that there'd be thousands of people have come and gone that I've seen come and go in my, my tenure as a wrestler, crazy. Now that's the thing about it is uh, I'm I I love this business more than anything. Like I, there's no way that you'll ever get me to not uh, pursue this, even in my age now, and not want to be in it. Like this is all that I am. This is how I live my life. Is I am a pro wrestler from that's all I've ever done. But it isn't WrestleMania. It isn't WrestleMania every day. Like there's a grind and they, people talk about nowadays, oh the grind, the grind. They really don't understand that uh, this is not uh, an industry that is built on stardom. It's not built, you, there's a very low percentage that make that, that big, big place. My first two years in pro wrestling, my first two years in this business, I didn't get a single dime. I went from town to town, I got beat up most of the time because it was still the old guys, and I would get beat up and not get any money. All I get for my trouble is lumps. This is what you want. This is what you want more than life. And so uh, when you get that brotherhood, and that's why we always call each other brothers. So when we have a brotherhood, when we have our set guys and we're traveling on the road, the, like you just have to keep your spirits up because there's a lot of times where spirits are down or they want to get you down. So that's probably why I've lasted so long. I've had a good group, and I always try to look it on the bright side. Uh, that, uh, me and my WWE relationship is kind of one of those things of, um, 
kind of like a stepson, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's maybe that's the best way to descri describe it. There is uh, maybe there's a, a there's definitely a mutual respect between uh, like definitely for me because that's always where I want it to be, and uh, they know who I am and what I'm capable of, and they understand that I'm I'm good at what I do. But the problem is, is we always seem to not meet up. We don't seem to um, um, have a, a, a good sense of timing. I've never had a great sense of timing with WWE. Even when I was there and I was almost like I was a full-time guy because I was on the road with them for about two years and I was always doing the shows and I was always in enhancement. I have more dark matches under my belt than any other human being on this planet that had no contract. I'm the guy that had multitude of matches, like over 30 matches that are dark matches that you'd never see that I have with that company uh, that people don't realize I have had the most matches with them. And everybody thought I was with the company back in 2002, because I 2002 to 2004, all I did was wrestle for them. I blew up my knee in 2004 on a show on Velocity with the company. So I blew up my knee with them, working for them, uh, and they took care of me, which was wonderful. As they got the surgeon in, I got in really quick, he fixed me up, they gave me physiotherapy, they even sent me a check. Tommy Dreamer, at the time, was in the office, and he sent me a check for like, I do believe it was $100, and I'm like, what is this check for? And he goes, because we wanted to pay your gas money from back and forth from physiotherapy every day. Well, like that's that's going above and beyond, in my opinion. They could have just let me let me rot if they wanted to, but they took care of me, which is wonderful. Um, but after that, I came back. I was in nowhere near the shape that I should have been. I was in nowhere near the mind frame that I should have been, and I let that opportunity to come back and be strong and to be better. I let that go. I, I made a mistake, and I, I dropped the ball on that, and then I didn't hear from them for years. Last time I did get the call from them, it was for the Cruiserweight Classic. So I did the 205, and I had a great time. It was a great experience, and I learned a lot. And you, you know, the same old, same old. You learn a lot. You uh, think, wow, this is this is great. And they called me back. A lot of people don't understand or don't realize is they called me back as soon as I was done flying home from my first set of uh, tapings. Now, I was eliminated on the first round, um, but they wanted me to come back down. They said they saw a lot of promise. They really enjoyed my stuff. They really wanted me to come back. So I came back down, or I had the intention of coming back down to not only uh, work as a filler between the matches on the Cruiserweight Classic, I was going to do that. I was also uh, going to coach for the week. So I saw that as an opportunity too of getting to be able to do some coaching. And also, I didn't know this at the time, but uh, I was also supposed to work for NXT. I was supposed to wrestle Kenta or Hideo Itami on his comeback. So his shoulder just had fixed and they wanted me to have uh, like a stronger style match with him because they knew I could. Uh, so this was my week. That was my week in hand. Um, I went to the border uh, to go back down. I'm at customs and uh, customs says, uh, you can't cross. This visa doesn't work. This is a business visa, which means you can't get paid. You gotta, um, you can't uh, come over here. You gotta go for meetings and stuff. Well, I'm, well, yeah, I am going for meetings. I'm going for a coaching opportunity uh, and to work on some stuff, but they'd seen my face and they knew who I was immediately. And the border is a tricky thing where sometimes rules don't really apply and then some other rules do apply. So I have been crossing for years. For years, my whole career, I have crossed the border with no issues. I've dro driven truck for about 10 years. So to cross the border was no big deal. I was always honest and say, I'm going to a wrestling show. And uh, they would let me go. On this day, the, the, the lady that was at the counter says, you can't cross. They're paying tickets to see an event that you're on. So that means that uh, you're taking jobs away from America. And so she said, you gotta go home. And so I was dumbfounded. I sat at that counter and I was dumbfounded. After waiting two hours, missing my first flight, I thought, well, I'll just get, a, I'll get rebooked on another flight and still make it down there. 
uh, there was no there was no flight to be had. She sent me home, so I had to rent a car and drive from Toronto to London, thinking for two hours about what was going down. Meanwhile, messaging and having the office uh, say uh, like say you're supposed to be down here for NXT tomorrow. You're supposed to do this, this, and this, and we got to try to fix this. And I was planning to uh, cross the border in Detroit and say, listen, I'm going to try it again. But then they said, don't do that, because if you get banned, then that's a whole different process. So what happened is I got flagged at the border, which means I can cross, but I'm going to get interrogated. They're going to put me in their little thing, holding cell for about two hours every single time. So this was, uh, the, you imagine on the way home, uh, the feeling like I thought the first time I blew out my knee and I was so close to a contract was one of those heart wrenching, gut stabbing moments. There was nothing like this one where everything had been lined up and the stars had aligned and I have not only uh, got a chance to perform on two different shows and give two different styles and uh, show them how, what I was all about a third time, which was like awesome. But I was also able to uh, give back and to be able to uh, work with their talent, which I was very excited about. All this was taken away by one woman's uh, who figures that on this day, uh, America needed that job. So uh, here I sit. And then I have not, I haven't tried, I tried crossing one more time for Rhino's charity show. I always did Rhino's charity show. And I went down because I had the flag on my passport for like about a year. You have it for about a year. They sent me home saying, well, you're flagged for wrestling. I'm like, well, it's a charity show. Well, you might get paid for this charity show. Or they might, not, they might be just saying it's a charity show for you to get across. I'm like, I don't know when these, when it's become this way. This border used to be so much easier to do. Like, I'm even talking after 9-1-1. 9-11 happened, and I could still cross that border with very little issue. But now there's issues. So it's just the way it goes. You just got to either roll with it or let it consume you. I refuse to let it consume me. But this is, this is the story of Tyson is... I want to make dad proud, but I'm still the stepson, so I'm going to just stay where I'm supposed to be on the other side of the fence. That's it. It's so neat to watch yourself in a big uh, style setting, like when the lights are on you, like with WWE or uh, TNA and stuff like that, to see your stuff and it will always be there. You're always in the archives. It's kind of a neat, kind of a neat thing. It's even better when you almost have your own children of the sport. And that's the only way to describe it. If you have students that have gone out and have become successful, and it's not just like I like I could take all the credit in the world, but it's a, you it, like the amount of kids you have to go through, and the amount of people that try this sport and then leave early, prematurely, or can't find success is like so huge that when you find that diamond in the rough and they finally make it, it is such a it's such a great feeling. Uh, the guys that I have under my under my belt that people. Uh, will know is like Michael Elgin. Michael Elgin always says that, and I'm very thankful because not many guys will uh, show that kind of uh, level of respect, but Elgin has showed me great deals of uh, respect uh, with it. Even being uh, with New Japan, I've been mentioned multiple times with New Japan over training Elgin. Uh, there's um, I know Idris Abraham, who is a young kid and is probably as close to my adopted son as I can have. Um, he's worth TNA Impact now. I always knew Rosemary had it. I always knew when she came in and she was this uh, awkward, tough, tough kid. And uh, I remember meeting her for the first time and she was uh, like from Manitoba. Tough, tough, tough. Uh, rugby kid, uh, came in real sporty. 
uh, easy to teach, like always uh, w wanting to learn, had a real, like a real, real clever, clever mind for movies. And we used to talk uh, more about movies because you find the interest in people, you find that first, and then see where you can develop them. Out of nowhere, here comes this character, and then it totally, it totally had me. That this Rosemary character was once the awkward girl that I had shown how to do a headlock or how to do a forearm. And uh, where she has taken her her character is uh, further than uh, like I could ever I could have ever taken her. Like it's captivating to watch her. I watch her on impact a couple times. I'm like, man, that's uh, I couldn't. I just it just blows baffles me baffles me. I'm like, how did you come from me in a prideful way? Because I, I like you have like done something outstanding. So Rosemary, I tell you, is amazing. Coaching is one of those things that um, I know that I'm not going to last forever. Your body can't hold on to this sport forever. So it's one of those things where I would love to transition into it before I get to the point where my showmanship isn't at level. If people are paying uh, $20 for a ticket, that's hard earned money that they've either, you know, they, they slaved away at and they've saved and they've not gotten something to save that money for this ticket. I feel as though that they should go away thinking that was great, that was a good show. This is to make their money's worth. So when I feel as though my body won't let me be at money's worth, I think that's when the transition will uh, be finished. But for now, while I'm still good, I can still work with people both on the school side and on the show side and then continue to make sure that the money is well spent in every way.